Hello, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are here watching PBS Books. Welcome so much today. We are so excited to have you with us for another fabulous event, which is a Library of Congress National Book Festival preview author talk. So today, um, PBS Books is here to really celebrate um, the 20 year anniversary of the National Book Festival, which is between uh, September 25th to 27th. This year, it is all virtual. And that means that from your home, you can go and enjoy um, the, the many authors, I think it's over 160 authors, um, both on demand as well as live all weekend. Um, and it culminates with actually a two hour PBS special on September 27th. But you must check your lo local listing because different locations, different PBS stations will be airing that at different moments. Another thing to note actually, which is so very exciting, is that Hoda Kotb from the Today Show will be um, hosting the, the PBS special. So we're so very thrilled to, to be here today to share with you about the excitement of PBS Books and the Library of Congress um, partnership. So before we get started, I just wanted to share a little bit with you why this is so very important. So yes, it's 20 years. But, um, Laura Bush actually started the National Book Festival 20 years ago. And this year, because of COVID, because we can't do this amazing event that normally brings 200,000 people to Washington every year to celebrate the literary luminaries of our country, the Library of Congress has decided to go virtual and to share it with the whole nation, not only those of us who have internet, which you do today if you're watching this, but also those of you who just have a TV um, in your house and you can then tune in to the PBS special. So we're so very thrilled to be here and to jump into the conversation. Um, so first up, we what I wanted to do is to share with you a little bit about who is you know who we're sharing tonight with and it's really south florida pbs and i'm so thrilled today um to have an amazing partnership with um with ann bocock who is the host of between the covers um so ann she is um with us today hello ann hi heather so can you share with me a little bit about what this special means for for you and for your community you know, this is so wonderful for South Florida PBS. And I it, it is, you know, I'm honored really to be part of the event. And not only for us, and I do welcome everyone in our South Florida community that, that's viewing this this evening, but also for, for our viewers nationwide. Thank you all for joining us. What this does, it, you know, this is your backstage pass. This gives viewers an inside look into the thoughts, into the ideas of some of the most renowned authors. So that's why, I, Heather, that is why I'm thrilled to be here today. And I have to tell you, I am doubly excited to announce that South Florida PBS will be airing the Library of Congress National Book Festival event, not once, but twice. <laughs> it's going to air October the 4th on WXCL and October the 11th on WPBT and be sure to check your local listings no matter where you are because different PBS stations, different markets air it at different times. So Heather, I'm delighted. Well, Anne, thank you so much. And we are so very thrilled that South Florida PBS is sharing um, the special twice. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a great way to be able to participate, to be able to join in the conversation, both that weekend before the 25th through the 27th, and then the culminating event um, that even comes later in October in, in South Florida. Um, so in just a minute, we'll actually be introducing our, our New York Times bestseller, Taya O. Obrick, who is um, who is you know quite the um, quite the amazing author and and before we do though what I wanted to do was really take a moment and give everyone a little bit of a sneak peek at, at a little bit that of what will happen um, on the 27th in the evening and actually all weekend before the culminating event with PBS um, so please uh, let's take a moment and watch this is a real. 
Hey, everybody. Welcome to the 20th Library of Congress National Book Festival. Hello, I'm Salman Rushdie. My name is Joy Harjo. I'm the 23rd U.S. Poet Laureate. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Reynolds. I am the current National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. I'm extraordinarily excited to welcome Jenna Bush Hager to the National Book Festival. My name is Haben Gurma. I'm a disability rights advocate and author. Welcome, everyone. We're here with Madeleine Albright, the 6th fourth Secretary of State. My name is Amy Tan, and I'm a novelist. I am Ann Patchett, and I am here with my friend Kate D. Camillo. Hi, I'm Sandra Cisneros. Hi, I'm John Grisham, here with the uh, National Book Festival. Books make us better human beings, better able to relate to one another, to think things through, and to take us to a better future. The theme of this festival is American ingenuity. And what exactly would you say, Colson, ingenuity is to you? Given what I've worked on for the last like six years, those two books, I would say it's uh, survival. People who never have to struggle or never have to work, they don't really have a lot of reasons to innovate or to fight their way out of something. That's the only thing we can count on in life is that there will be problems, that there will be pain. We have these enormous capabilities, and yet here we are, sleepwalking, unable to awaken and to create the future that we need to create. What literature has always done is to give readers new ways of framing the world. And I think you can't function in the world today if you don't understand the history. History has to be spoken about as conversation because ultimately that's what it is. The great possibility of America is that we affirmatively decided that reason would be a guiding principle. You have to be free, free as including as many imaginations as possible. Often, our best examples of creativity live in the in-between spaces. But it's the coping, that's where the story is. I mean, the, the coping is the joy, and the joy is the journey. This year, in 2020, when we are in need for inspiration and a way for American ingenuity to lead us forward, these creative minds surely do remind us why the importance of memory, the need for reason, and the key to imagination are all rooted in words we find on the page. And we are back. I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and we are back with PBS Books. Today we are celebrating and partnering with the Library of Congress um, for their 2020 National Book Festival. The festival is being held online between September 25th and 27th, and it will conclude with a two-hour PBS special. Now it's time to introduce featured guest um, and author, Taya Obert. Her New York Times bestselling book, the Tiger's Wife won the 2011 Orange Prize for Fiction and was in 2011 also the National Book Award finalist. Also, her recent novel, Inland, Inland, I'm sorry, was named one of the best books of the year by the Washington Post, Time, and the Library Journal. It was also named among President Obama's summer reading list picks for 2019. Taya was also named one of the 20 best American fiction writers under 40 by the New Yorker. So today we have with us, as you already met, Ann Bocock from South Florida PBS. And I'm excited to have both Ann with Taya, and I'd like to hand over the conversation to Ann for the interview today. So Ann, thank you so much for moderating the conversation, and I'll see you at the end of the show. Thank you, Heather. I am probably more excited than you are. And Taya, thank you again for doing this. Uh, it, this is wonderful. First of all, I've got to ask, how is your life? How is your career? How is your routine changed? Is it any different because of the pandemic and, and what we're all going through? 
Oh my goodness. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm this is such an honor to be here and and uh, to participate in in this celebration of of uh, literature with you and and uh, with everyone at the Library of Congress and and, and at PBS as well. Um, I'm um, you know I I think um, writers have a tendency. Well, I as a writer have a tendency to be a relatively anxious person. So I think that. Um, as is the case with everyone else, the the the, the existential dread and anxiety that's been um, dredged up by this pandemic, and by the news that is arriving daily of um, its fluctuations, is is terrifying. Obviously, um, but I, I have found uh, personally that um, as a writer, uh, I'm someone who spends a lot of time alone. Um, and, uh, my, uh, you know, my, 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 my daily process, um, for my work, um, has a tendency to be very isolated and, and very isolating. And, and, and so in that sense, I, I know it has not been as hard for me to isolate as it has been for many, many, many people I know, including my current and former students, um, and, and I think that that's where, where you know, I, I've seen the most effect. Uh, uh, you know, as a teacher, um, I have been a lot more affected and, and, and a lot more sort of um, uh, conscious of, of, of how it's pressing in on, on the lives of young people than, than, than in my own uh, personal practice. That's really interesting. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of your work. A lot of your storylines are vaguely based on, on Balkan culture. So how does heritage, how does your upbringing really influence you as a storyteller? Oh, that's a wonderful question. <laughs> um, and it's something that, I, that I'm sort of constantly trying to figure out. Um, I, I think one of the most prominent uh, ways that 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 it affects me as a as a storyteller is that um, you know I'm 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 uh, often grouped with magical realists um, and my my work has often been described as as magical realism because it it has these um, it often has these kind of unavoidable on the writing front um, flashes of the supernatural um, which, which sometimes to me feel like they're completely out of my control. Um, and, um, I, I think that this is because of the storytelling tradition from which I come, um, which particularly in its treatment of mythologies, um, and folklore always leaves the door open for a little bit of the supernatural possibility to enter the story. Um, and that's something that, that I've found really inextricable from the, the way I tell stories. There always has to be uh, an opening for something unexpected and, and usually um, unmatched uh, with, the, with the real world uh, to come into the narrative. I, I love it. But Inland, the, your, your latest book, it's interesting, it takes place in the late 1800s, I think 1893, if I'm correct. And this is in the very lawless Arizona territory, which is a far cry from your first book. What was it that drew you to creating a Western story? Um, I was really surprised that that's where I ended up. Um, I, I think, um, after, I did not expect you to say that. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I just, you know, it was, it was, it was as much a surprise for me as, as I think it was for my, for my editor who, um, <laughs> who, uh, uh, you know, saw the great American desert stretching out in the, in the book and was like, what's this? Um, so I, uh, you know, I, I came here uh, at the age of, of twelve. I came to America at the age of twelve, and and but I had I had been raised in uh, the former Yugoslavia until the age of seven, and in Cyprus and in Egypt, um, we spent much of my my childhood traveling, um, and um, America's mythos in in my childhood sensibility has had always been wrapped up in in the genre of the Western. Um, I think as is the, as the as is the case for most people, um, kind of regardless of where they come from. Um, and I, 
I knew the mythology of the West. I knew some of the history of the West, but I, I hadn't spent a great deal of time out here. I'm currently in Wyoming. I'm coming to you from Wyoming. Um, I hadn't spent a great deal of time out here until after The Tiger's Wife was published. And um, I was shocked when I came to the Mountain West and to um, the Southwest um, by how incredibly uh, spiritually at home I felt. Um, it, it, it felt like a real homecoming, uh, which was shocking to me because I, I don't have any cultural roots here and I, and I don't have any family out here. Um, and, you know, typically you come home to places that are innate to your upbringing rather than something sort of, I guess, more personal um, and or, or personal in your in your later evolution in life. Um, and so I, I guess what, what ended up happening was that Inland became my immigrant novel. Um, I became very interested in the tension between the mythology and history of the American West um, in, in the development of that um, and, and the reality of it. Uh, and, and I wrote a couple of different drafts of books uh, and, and then uh, and put them away and put them away and uh, then found this incredible true story that despite all my research in the years leading up to it, I had never heard before. Um, and it had one foot in the Ottoman Empire of the 19th century and one foot in the American West. And I think that that combination really drew me in um, because it, it felt like a, a meshing of, of you know, the, the world from which I had come and, and the world in which I, I ended up. Um, and above all, it was, it was based on these true stories that were, that were so improbable, like I couldn't believe them when, when I first heard them. But yet they were true. Yeah. You know, Taya, ideas sometimes, well, they all pop into your heads at, at, you know, when you're least suspecting. And I'm wondering, do you remember the idea, what, what it looked like, what it, maybe what it, it sounded like when you were writing Tiger's Wife and when you were writing Inland that made you think, oh, I can write an entire book about this. <laughs> um, I, I remember the feeling um, I think that my prevailing, I remember the feeling of, of how it was when it was going well. I think my prevailing sentiment with any project is, can I write a whole anything about this? Um, and it's just sort of this constant train of doubt um, that, that pulls me through. Um, I, I remember, um, with, with Tiger's Wife, it was this, for me, it's often images for different writers. It's different things. It's, it's a, it's a, um, it's a feeling, it's an image. And for me, it's an image with a, with, a, with a question at its center. So for The Tiger's Wife, I remember being really, really attached to this image of a, a tiger in the snow um, and the question surrounding its, its, um, how it had gotten there and who cared that it was really there. Um, and with, with Inland, when I, um, when I heard the podcast um, that, that uh, first alerted me to the, to the, to the truth of the, um, the story. Um, uh, part of it was about this, um, these two homesteading women in Arizona in the, in the 19th century who uh, are, are confronted by an apparition, a, 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 an animal apparition that they can't explain. Uh, and right away I was seized with the question of um, what has been going on in this, these women's day um, the, the, the shared day of these women um, before this moment happens. And that's sort of, and trying to answer that question and get to the root of why that image is staying with you so much is, is what propels me through work. So you can't get rid of the image. You know it's going to go in, into the book. Once you know the direction you're going, let's say you know the time period, you know the environment. At that point, how do you approach your research? That's a great question. Um, well, with this book, with, with Inland, um, it was sort of a, a different journey than it was for, for The Tiger's Wife. Um, the Tiger's Wife, though, though it was um, based on certain baked in details about um, Balkan mythology and, and, and Balkan storytelling, um, 
there wasn't very much research to be done. And so the, the discovery of the book was, you know, what happens, who are these characters? Um, you know, what's the, what's the emotional journey here? And um, with Inland, because it was based on uh, the true yarn of the Red Ghost of Arizona and the uh, adjoining uh, or uh, sorry, adjacent um, true story of the United States Camel Corps, uh, I knew that there was, you know, uh, history provided the plot, history provided sort of the, the chain of events and, and, and how the book was going to both begin and end. So the process of discovery was about the life, the characters, um, and what it means that this particular story, that these two particular stories have come together in this particular way, supposedly in truth. Um, so the, the research for this was um, was very extensive. I, I, I read uh, a, a tremendous amount of um, material about the time period, everything I could find about the United States Camel Corps, which wasn't a lot because the experiment, uh, which started out as just sort of a, a, an attempt to see whether camels could serve reliably as pack animals in the exploration of the American Southwest, um, the experiment was was considered a, a failure, um, and I don't think it's a spoiler to say that. Um, and and you probably know it was considered a failure because for the most part we haven't heard of it. And if it had been a success, we'd know all about it. And camels would be, you know, um, would be a, a symbol of the American West uh, as the horses. Um, so there was just enough um, real information ab about this uh, episode of history. Um, to give room for invention. Um, and, and to me, that's the best kind of space to be working in. You know, you, you have, there's truth, and then it just sort of sets you off on a little, um, a little trajectory of, of, of discovery um, about things that might have been. When you know you have this, and, it, it, it's, and you know you've got the story that you think you want to write, do other storylines pop up? Do you, do you ever, do your initial plans ever change and you go in a totally different direction? Oh my goodness, um, they, they do. Um, and, and I think that, uh, I always tell my students to sort of be open to, to those stories popping in because um, one of the ways you know you're on the right track is when the work itself surprises you and when you can't quite anticipate, when you, when you end up with unanticipated elements of the story on the page. Um, so there's a huge, this, this particular book um, follows two storylines. One is of Lurie, uh, an Ottoman immigrant who becomes an outlaw and, and uh, joins the United States Camel Corps. And the other is Nora, a homesteading woman uh, who is waiting for her husband's return on a, on a, a sort of drought addled ranch in, in Arizona in the 1890s. Um, and uh, one of the storylines that sort of made its way into the second narrative um, was this whole newspaper wars thing. Uh, her husband is a newspaper man and um, his newspaper is at war with another newspaper um, that belongs to a town that is is uh, trying to take over the county seat from the town in which they live, Amarillo. And um, this was based on, you know, on, on real elements of Western history that I had found and, and, and which felt very sort of pertinent to the moment. This, this notion of um, media clashes and, and uh, questions about who gets to tell the story first and how the story gets to be remembered. Uh, and that really surprised me. It surprised me that it was um, such a huge part of, of uh, Western life. Um, and it surprised me that it became such a huge part of the book. This is leading me right in, in into my next question because you're you've done your research. You, you are you are a master at at doing the research. And when you're writing what is considered historical fiction, you, you really need to do it. It has to it has to be a lot of the themes and the ideas in inland really do mirror things that are happening now in 2020 and. Is this intentional or is it just evolution? Is it a natural thing that happens in the process of writing? 
Um, I think it, it happens. It's a that's a really great question and, and something that I, that I that I realized about you know halfway through the book. Um, and I think it's a, a, a natural part of the evolution of writing um, because your your psychology, the psychology of the writer, I think will inevitably, there's a lot of theories about this and, and different people feel very strongly and very differently about this. I feel very strongly that the psychology of the writer and um, the emotional state of the writer really make their way into the book no matter what, um, because it is something that is born of you um, and you are a product of your time um, and you are grappling with, you are writing the story because you are trying to answer certain questions for yourself as well, right? You're giving to the novel, but the novel is giving back. Um, so that's, that's one aspect of it. Another though, is that um, as I did the research and learned about sort of range wars and you know the the battle between large uh large scale holdings of cattle for instance and uh small farmers um and the battle between newspapers um and you know the um the 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 progress of the railroad um the breaking of treaties all these things uh, with, with with native people um all, all these things uh, are echoes from the past of, of, of things that are going on now. And, and what it made me realize is that, I mean, for, for lack of a, a better way to put it, and at the risk of sounding incredibly cliched, you know, history repeats itself. Um, but, it, and it not only repeats itself, but it also never ever goes away. Like if a, if, if a, if a tendency in a culture um, is unresolved, we keep returning to it. I, you can't help it, as you said. It, it's it's evolution. It's how you you write the novel. I'm curious what authors or or innovators have inspired you to maybe think differently about your work or how your work has has changed through the years. Oh my goodness! Um, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the, the, um, I I started with a with a um, very um, I think I, I, as a, as a starting reader, particularly in English, I started with, with a very Russian focused, um, uh, sort of palette, if you will. Um, I loved, and I still love, uh, Mikhail Bulgakov. And, and I think the master and Margarita is, is, um, one of the most, uh, uh, incredible and important works, um, of art. Uh, to exist, <laughs> not just, you know, of literature or, or of the 20th century, but um, just period. Uh, but, but um, you know, coming to America, learning about um, American literature and American art um, and, and trying to um, not innovate myself, but but learning from innovators in that context, you know, I, I think that that a seminal moment for me was was reading the work of Toni Morrison for the first time, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, being suddenly growing familiar with the American ghost story, and I, I do think that she's a master of the American ghost story. Um, finding the American ghost story for the first time and realizing its rootedness in, in, in history and um, the way that it stretches forward into the present. Um, and then, you know, uh, recently, uh, no, well, not recently, well, over the last three years, I've become really obsessed with Shirley Jackson and, and, and her work and, and um, uh, her storytelling modes and, and her ghost stories as well. And so there's, there's a lot to discover. And my students are constantly, constantly, uh, uh, you know, uh, funneling their passions for um, literature into, into my knowledge base as well. So it's, it keeps growing. Well, we know if we've read your work that you love ghost stories. Yeah. And so do we. <laughs> thank you for that. You know, we talked about this a little bit at, at the beginning, but due to the pandemic, what we have, found is that there is a real increase in the amount of Americans reading. They have more time at home. I mean, it, it's like they found something new. Can you share what maybe what you're reading and, and are there authors that 
you, we did talk, you just mentioned a few that have inspired you, but who would you recommend? Um, this is a, uh, <laughs> this is, I'm late to this game, um, but I have just become obsessed with Elena Ferrante, um, and um, I'm, I, I just finished Days of Abandonment, and, and I love her work so, so much. Um, I, I, I'm very, very late to this party. I think I think most people caught Ferrante fever uh, some years ago when when it was first, um, you know, taking off. And uh, sadly, I was not one of those people. And there's um, a brand new book, so you can add that to your list too. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, it, it, it was the perfect time to discover her because, man, when you run out of books and then you realize, goodness, I have to wait um, years uh, for this author's next book, uh, it's really painful, um, and 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 yet uh, it has worked out perfectly for me. Um, I'm also reading the Overstory, um, which uh, won the 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 Pulitzer uh, some some years ago, and um, late to that party as well. But uh, I'm I'm very much enjoying it and feeling very moved by it. And and perhaps it was not such a fantastic um, idea to to read a book about. Um, well, the devastating effects of, of climate change and, and the evolution of, of um, well, the, the devolution of our, our world uh, right now. But, you know, I've, I've blundered into that, I suppose. Um, and this year, I think one of the best books that came out um, that I, I absolutely adored is um, uh, Parakeet by uh, Maria Len Bertino, um, which is just a wonderful, strange, small personal story. Um which starts with a with a bride who's who's questioning her um, her decision to get married, and her grandmother visits her in the form of a parakeet um, in her bridal suite a few days before the the wedding. I will add that to my list, Taya. Thank you. Was there a moment, and I know there had to have been, in your life where you went, "I am going to be a writer, nothing else." Yes. Uh <laughs> what was it? It came really early, and I and I think it's sort of it's sort of steeped in this in this youthful uh, naivete, and 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 I was lucky that my my mother um, and my mother indulged me in it. Um, I was very young; I was eight years old. We were living in Cyprus. Um, we had just left the former Yugoslavia um, for the first time, and uh, my mother had somehow acquired this this ancient, ancient laptop. I mean, it was massive and like clunky and old. Um, and her sort of bargain with me was that I was allowed to use it if I practiced my English writing on it. Um, and so I would, you know, I would, I would go into the word processor and, and, and type these little stories in an attempt to, to sort of um, raise my language game. And uh, one day I wrote and finished, uh, which is very important, um, as I would, I would discover later on in my writing life, uh, a story about a, a goat who has a, a terrible day. Um, and I took the, you know, I, I picked up the laptop and I carried it to my mother and I said, look, I wrote this whole thing. It was about that long. Um, and uh, I, I, this is what I want to do. I want to be a writer. Um, and my mother, who is an economist, <laughs> was like, great. Um, but in fairness to her, she was, you know, she was really, really accepting of the idea. Um, as long as I, as long as I had some, you know, vocational, um, thing to fall back on. So when I went, I went to college, I, I studied creative writing and art history. Um, <laughs> I knew you were going to say you were a child when you wanted to, when you knew, I didn't realize you were eight years old. So that one, that, that's great. We, you teach and we have a lot of viewers that are aspiring writers. They want to be a novelist. They want to be you. So I want to know what your advice is for them. And also, what was the best advice you ever got? Oh, my goodness. That's a great question. Um, well, my, my advice to them is that, um, you know, don't follow trends. Don't try to be the next blank. Um, the reason you're drawn to writing in particular and to storytelling in general is because you have some perspective um, of the world or some story that you need to tell that is bursting to get out of you. Um, and that is unique to you as, as, a, as an individual, as, uh, as, a, as a conscious being, right? Um, and so your need to tell a story 
and your ability to tell a story are intertwined. Um, and I think listen to that, be present in, in, in that need and ask yourself, why am I telling this? What will, uh, what will it do for me to tell this story? Um, and, and how can I tell it so that what it means to me translates to the, to the reader as well? Because I think that those are the books that really, really grab you. Like the, the map of somebody else's consciousness, the map of someone else's need to share um, a way of being with us is is the thing that draws us in and stays with us and and that is universal regardless of what where you are in your practice of writing um another piece of advice i have is that there are no wasted drafts uh you know you may work on something for many years and and have to put it in the drawer and say to yourself god that was a huge waste of time and it wasn't because the process of discovering the things that you don't want to, to, to be on the page, the, the stories you um, have no need to tell anymore or um, mechanisms of storytelling that don't work for you. All this is, is gathering uh, uh, to make you the writer that you're going to end up being. And it's really, really important. It's a, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of material thrown away, but none of it is wasted in writing. Um, and the best advice I ever got um, was from the great writer, David Mitchell, um, who was uh, kind enough to, we were, we were at a festival together and, and he was kind enough to, to um, be listening to my post Tiger's Wife uh, woes of, of, of actually trying to figure out what it was I was going to write next. And, and, and I told him, um, you know, I, uh, I feel like every word, every sentence that I write in this new project I'm writing could have been um, you know, a sentence from the tiger's wife. And he looked at me and he said, um, why did you not write the tiger's wife? Why is that distressing? <laughs> um, and I thought, well, I, well, I did. And he said, well, how do you expect to be a different, how do you think you're going to be a different writer? You haven't even written anything new yet. Um, and it was, uh, it was, it was really <laughs> good <laughs> advice. That's good. I, I spoke with a sculptor one time who said that when she got this, the big slabs of marble, that the piece was already in there. She just had to chip away. And that's very much what, what you said, that the, the story is there. Yeah. You just have to get it out. Yeah, exactly. And you have to, and you have to optimize the way that it is then seen from the outside, right? Um, yeah. Cool. What does it mean to you to be a part of this, of the Library of Congress National Book Festival? And how important is it, do you think, for all of us to, to have this, to be able to take part in this? Oh my goodness. Um, so, you know, it, it's, just, it's just such a vital, vital way for us to um, connect, not only to each other in this particularly difficult time, um, but to really, really pay attention to, um, look, this, this pandemic has, has, um, brought out some of, um, has, has been an incredible tragedy for not just the nation, but for the world in, in many, many ways. Um, I think it has shown us a lot about life, the things we rely on to, um, get through our lives and, and the way that, um, those things can fail, the ease with which those things can fail. Uh, it has also um, highlighted, you know, these social movements that have been uh, brewing for years and that have, have finally um, taken hold of, of, of our society in, in, in the way that they deserve to. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking in particular about the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and this is a time, I think, when we are hearing each other's stories. We have the opportunity to hear and truly listen and engage with each other's stories in, in a massive um, life-changing and society-changing way. And we've been shown um, quite suddenly and in an unexpected way how resistance to certain truths can cost us. Um, as a nation and as a society and as a species, you know? And so, so I think that um, gatherings like this, where many stories are shared, where we come to the table with our minds open and, and prepared to, 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 to engage with things that can be 
difficult and uncomfortable um, are so vital for, for the course of, of life. Um, and, and it's just such an incredible honor to be part of that. For me. Hey, that was so well said. I dare not ask another question. Sure. How about we go to some audience questions because we have viewers that, that have asked. Are you okay with that? Yes, of course. And thank All you right. viewers for being here. Our first question is from Linda Sales, wanting to know, what do you teach? Because we talked about your teaching and we didn't say what it was. What oh, do you think? Um, yes, no, I, I should have I should have mentioned that. I, um, I teach creative writing. Um, I am currently the endowed chair of creative writing at the Master of Fine Arts program at Texas State University in San Marcos. Um, and uh, essentially, um, you know, people often ask, can you teach writing? Um, and I think that there's a sort of big debate about the, um, or there has been in the past, a, a big debate about the, the usefulness of, of MFAs um, in both the literary landscape and in, in an individual writer's life. Um, but uh, what we hope to provide is a, is a sense of community. And, um, and I think you can teach, or I hope that you can teach um, aspiring writers the tools by which they can, um, the tools to which they can go back when when certain elements of, of writing fail them or when they struggle in 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 the very very isolated landscape of writing. If anyone has questions, please send them along. I should have said that before, but we were so involved in our in our talk, I forgot. So please go ahead and and type them in and send them, and and we will definitely try to get them. Uh, Linda wants to know if you are working on a new book. I'm sure you are, but can you share something with us? I can. I I um I feel okay sharing. Uh, 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 it's, you know, it's 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 strange. I think sometimes you sort of um you feel like if you share too early, the whole thing collapses, and 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 that's that has been true in the past for me. Um, so with a grain of salt, <laughs> I say that uh, I'm currently working on a desert island book um, about a, a, a young woman who gets washed up on a, on a desert island um, and she doesn't know where she is and she has no frame of reference for what's going on around her. I like that. I kind of like how you might have to do the research for that too. <laughs> That's kind of nice. And we're a lot of reading about books. Um. <laughs> you can take a lot of books with you. Where do you find the books that you want to read? Oh, my goodness. Um, you read reviews or, or you just have particular authors that you go back in time and, and look for? I... I I have um, I, uh, so much of my reading right now, if I'm, if I'm perfectly honest, so much of my reading right now comes from my students um, uh, because they, um, they often, in, in, in the niches in which they have uh, 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 grown up as, as both readers and writers, um, there's a whole world of both American and international literature that, that, that I've just never encountered. Um, and of course now I don't have a single name in my head because naturally that's how it works. Um, but uh, it, it's been uh, really, really wonderful to, 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 to be exposed to the, to the work that, that they're loving. Um, and unfortunately, given pandemic times, uh, one of the other ways I find books is I go to the bookshop and I, I walk around the aisles and, and you know, leaf through. Um, and I think that this is, you know, um, in both pandemic and non-pandemic, I mean, it's difficult in pandemic times because you can't really go and like linger in the bookshop and some bookshops might not be open. And for the first, first part of the pandemic, they definitely weren't. But people who work uh, at independent bookshops, uh, this is their life. And their recommendations are, uh, have often led me to some of the best um, literary discoveries and, and most fruitful and, and joyous literary discoveries of, of my life. So, uh, you know, use those booksellers, you know, give them support and let them support you in your in your in your uh, in the expansion of your mind. I, I just have one more because we mentioned at the beginning that you grew up in Yugoslavia. Are your books translated or are, 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 are you like the most popular writer? In Yugoslavia, I don't think I'm the most popular writer, but I I, I, I have certainly been um, 
thrilled and delighted with um, the readership that that, that I have um, uh, in 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 my home reaches. Um, I, uh, I I sometimes have the the um, privilege of, of uh, talking to my translators. Um, both of my books have been have been translated um, uh, in in uh, multiple areas of, of the former Yugoslavia, um, and it's such a it's so gratifying and and moving and and at the same time really really strange to read my words translated into my um uh native language uh because i you know i, I left it i am flu whoops i am a fluent <laughs> i'm a fluent speaker um or mostly fluent but I, I i don't retain the language proficiency enough to be able to write in it um and it's like a whole it's it's like uh, it's like interacting with another person it's really um Lovely for me. This has been so much fun, such a pleasure. And I, I know that I, I can't believe how fast the time has gone. And mm -hmm. I am going to throw it back to Heather because there she is. Hello. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Taya. This was extraordinary. And Anne, you did an amazing job guiding the conversation and the journey. Taya, for you to share your insights, your inspirations, your book that you're working on. It's its really been wonderful for us. And we wanted to let everyone know that you can, of course, see more and see Taya and other amazing authors um, at the Library of, of Book, excuse me, the Library of Congress National Book Festival, September 25th through the 27th, which culminates in the two hour show. Um, so we hope, and in South Florida, it will be in October. So we hope, of course, that everyone will join us. And as Taya said so brilliantly, during these times, we hope every American will really not only hear, but listen to these stories and these stories of amazing storytellers. Um, so thank you both for this amazing evening. We hope that uh, we will get to work with you again, both uh, between the covers with South Florida PBS and Taya when your Desert Island book comes out. We hope to see you again. Um, but this has been a really special evening. Before you go, just in case you both want to join us or the viewers out there, we certainly hope that on Monday you all will join us for Joe Harjo and Rita Dove will be will be. Um, two poet laureates will be um, at PBS Books on a similar uh, engagement uh, virtual event. So we hope to see everyone again. And this has just been an outstanding evening. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. So from PBS Books, we'll see you again soon. Thank you.